All right, well, welcome to La Posta. Thank you, Tom, for hosting us here. Uh, how is the food? I see everybody very uh, busy here, so I'm thinking that it's really good food. Thank you for, for having us. Uh, we're very excited uh, to have you all here. My name is Griselda Martinez. I am the Deputy Director for the Economic Development Department for the City of Las Cruces, and I want to thank um, the staff members that are here, Cruz and Donald. Uh, we thank you for the work that you've done to put this together. I want to also take a chance to thank our partners. The Chambers, Debbie and Kerry, are here, and also the Hispanic Chamber was a big part of this initiative and in creating this uh, boot camp for you all. We really hope that you get a lot of uh, information and a lot of ideas. And very important, take a moment to network among yourselves. Uh, networking among business owners is a big component to brainstorming, connecting to resources that other people have been able to use, but also uh, sharing challenges and how you've gone through those uh, to be able to continue successfully the operation of your business is a key component. So um, we look forward to an amazing uh, series of speakers. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to Tom for him to introduce them. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Martinez. A big hand for Dr. Martinez and, <laughs> and all the city staff and uh, both chamber, all three chambers for putting this uh, event together. Um, it's a special time for us here at La Posta. I'm not only your host today, but I'm also a co-moderator. And it's also our 80th birthday this year. So, <laughs> so, Jesse, let me get you. Um, what's really neat about this subject matter is apropos for me because I'm going to try to figure out how to get the word out that it's our, we're 80 years old over the next 10 months. But what I thought I'd share with you today um, is a, a newspaper article, actually an advertisement that appeared in Las Cruces Sun News September 14th, 1939. And it announced the grand opening of a New Mexican cafe that wasn't quite named yet. Whoever showed up that night got to put whatever name they wanted on a piece of paper. And Katie selected La Posta Cafe. And so two days later, on September 16th, 1939, La Posta opened. So my question for Dave Wilson, who's going to be our keynote presenter. David, what were my choices for marketing back in 1939? How was I going to get the word out that I was opening a cafe? Word of mouth. <laughs> um, no social media. It would have been newspaper, obviously. You have an example there. Yeah. Um, and uh, radio would have been a. So no TV, radio, some print, and a little directory. Bit of word of mouth. So uh, pretty neat stuff. And of course, back then, the Messiah was a little village with uh, dirt roads. And in fact, the, uh, the Posta started on. Uh, on a dirt floor with four four tables and no running water. So we come a long way, baby. Um, I want to get an idea for who we have here in the audience in terms of uh, public, private sector, business owners, students, et cetera. So if you're from the public sector, raise your hand. Public sector, very good. Private sector, raise your hand. Excellent. Those of you in the private sector that own a business, raise your hand. Wonderful. And then do we have any students? Very good. So we got a pretty good cross-section. I want to give our panelists an idea of the, of the mix of, uh, of our audience. Uh, I had the good fortune of participating in our very first boot camp, uh, business boot camp, uh, along with our, my co-moderator, uh, Jed Fanning, uh, probably a couple months ago. And the subject matter then was leadership and culture in an organization. And I think all of us can attest, private public sector alike, that that is so critical to the success of an organization. So we, we spoke for a couple hours on that, had a blast. Uh, sharing stories. Uh, of course, I, I'm a military guy, uh, retired Navy captain, and so I shared a few few sea stories there. Uh, anyway, two incredibly pieces, two incredible uh, important factors for successful business: leadership and culture. But as as Cruz and and Mandy and, and Jed and I contemplated what would be the sec uh, the uh, subject matter for our second business boot camp, uh, first thing that came to mind to me was marketing. I mean, you got to admit, those of us that have marketing resources to spend, where do you put it nowadays? It's such a, it's, it's a mystery. It's, it's a lot of guesswork. And, and I, I look to good folks like my keynote present presenter, Dave Wilson, who I guess I'm one of your clients as well. But Dave and I have worked on several projects over the years. Uh, he's a wonderful thinker. 
But, you know, you need to talk with someone that's in the industry that lives and breathes it every day to kind of get a feel for where your marketing dollars need to go. And that's not necessarily uh, the same for every industry. Uh, for those of us in the hospitality industry, it might mean two or three different uh, media uh, marketing options and to include social media. For those of you that are manufacturers or something like that, it could be something else. So it's not always clear as to, to uh, how we spend our marketing dollars. I'm hoping that your big takeaway today is it'll be a little bit clear. Uh, so let me start by introducing uh, a couple of good friends of mine that will be participating today. The first is my co-moderator, uh, Jed Fanning. Uh, Jed is a 1990... 1983. 1983 graduate of NMSU. Uh, he went to the Southwest Graduate School of Banking and graduated there in 1992. Jed's had a distinguished career in banking over 33 years. Uh, started in El Paso, Las Cruces, went up to Albuquerque and we stole him back from Albuquerque, brought him back here and he became president and CEO of Citizens Bank January 1st this year. Uh, if, if I were to read Jed's bio, bio, he'd have a long list of community involvement including several boards in the Albuquerque area and in Las Cruces area, and more, most recently, he's on the board of directors of the Las Cruces, Greater Las Cruces Chamber of Commerce. So help me welcome Jed Fanning. <laughs> this next guy, uh, he's our keynote presenter, a 1981 graduate of NMSU's journalism school. Uh, Dave left us and went down to work in El Paso in his field for several years before coming back to work for Borman Ford, Frank Borman Ford, uh, in 1989. Then in 1994, he and uh, Frank Borman uh, formed what was the Wilson, or Borman Wilson? Borman, or Wilson? Yeah, it was Wilson. It was Wilson. How did you get your name first? <laughs> Good for you. Negotiating? Yeah, so it was, it was Wilson Borman Advertising Agency in 1994. Of course, they were a big car dealer back then as well. And then shortly thereafter, uh, Frank Borman pulled back and, and uh, Dave brought on Ken Binkley and now it's the Wilson Binkley Advertising Agency, which is, if, you, if you're familiar with them, the largest advertising, marketing, and public relations firm in our region. Uh, when I, and I've done several things with Dave over the years, but typically when he walks in the room, he's not only one of the better thinkers, he's probably the smartest guy. Uh, that's how much I, I look to Dave for for his expertise, I'm really looking forward to your presentation today. So please welcome Dave Wilson. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. I don't know if I can live up to that. Um, but uh, it's, it's an honor and a, a privilege to do this. I haven't done this in a while, so I had to get creative and get out of the box a little bit. But I've been doing this for almost 40 years. I got a degree in mass communications, a journalism degree at Mexico State, with an emphasis in advertising. If you got that degree in Mexico, it would be propaganda, an emphasis in propaganda. But uh, I've seen a lot of things happen through the industry uh, over the years. And what I wanted to bring to the table today is uh, really share with you three of my passions, advertising, uh, history, and kind of old things, which I've put here on the table. That, that represent kind of the technology and it's, you know, really, it's, it, it shows you kind of where we've come from, but you know, if we go this way to this end of the table, you know, we've got a computer, but it's different forms of technology. But everything that's up here has something in common and that is they deliver content. And I'm gonna talk today about the big macro marketing picture of, of the 30,000 foot you know, picture of, of marketing uh, and, and in terms of demographics. And then we'll get into the different media. And, and really what I want to do is take you through how it's transitioning, talking about the demographical groups uh, as America ages um, and generations turn over, and, and talk about where it's going, which you've got a panel here that's going to talk a lot about uh, social media, digital media. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, to look at it from a, a, a demographical point of view. So how many people here have heard of the GI generation? They know what the GI generation is? It's the greatest generation. The greatest generation were people born in the United States from 1901 to about 1924, okay? Most people in that generation are 90, they're 95 years or older, okay? so. In America, there's probably three or four million of those people left. It's, that's quite a few people, but in the relevance of other demographical groups, it's not. But those people, when they were born, 
read newspaper, they grew up with newspaper. And they grew up with a phone, you know, in their, somebody's home or the business, and there were phone directories. So th that generation was pretty much born into the print generation, okay? The next generation was the silent generation. The silent generation went from 1925 up to about 1942, okay? So right up to World War II. That generation, they were born with newspaper, they were born with a phone, a phone directory, and this gizmo. Does anybody know what this gizmo is? It's a radio. It's a radio from 1923, which is kind of interesting. The first commercial radio station went on the air in the United States, which was really true mass media, in 1922. So this is the very beginning. It had a headset. Not very many people had them, but by 1938, there were there were um, roughly you know we had roughly 34 million households that had radio in it. 83 percent of homes had radio. So the silent generation grew up with radio. The next generation is the baby boomer generation, my generation. And that starts in 43 and goes up to 1960. So does anybody know what this is? It's a, it's a television, believe it or not. Matter of fact, the screen I have here on my phone is bigger than the screen on that television. So, and then at the end of the table is the computer. And we don't start to see the computer come in to later on, but the boomer generation and the Generation X, which really goes from 1961 to about 1981, Generation X really grew up with newspaper, radio, television, okay? And then we get to Generation uh, uh, Y, the millennials that go from 1982 to the turn of the century, 2001, and they grew up with a lot of this technology, but they started to acclimate to computers and cell phones. And then when we get to Generation Z, which is after 2001, that generation, it's, it's all, you know, computer games, computers, these devices. So how many people today brought their radio with them? Anybody bring a radio with them? Yeah, you did. This is a radio, okay? And it's a transmitter. And it's a television. And it's talking to me right now. Uh, and, and it's a computer. And it's a phone directory. It does everything up here that, that, that these devices do. And they, they deliver content. Matter of fact, what's so interesting about all this is that television was actually invented in 19, late 1920s. It was demonstrated at the Chicago World's Fair in 1933-34. And they wrote about it in trade magazines in 1935. And I'll, I'll, I'll let you guys, I'll circulate this around because it's really interesting. But it says, what does a radio set look like in 1950? Well, strangely enough, they show a, a TV screen on top of a traditional radio cabinet printing out pictures and newspapers. I've seen examples of newspaper. And it has a microphone. So they were prophesizing that this, this newfangled device, television, combined with radio, was going to replace, you know, eventually radio. And, and that was going to happen in 1950. Well, that didn't, that didn't happen, really. But uh, I'll go ahead and let you guys pass it around. So what's really interesting is we have all these demographical groups, okay? So we're losing the GI generation. And, and what's happening in the, it, to the GI generation? You know, how many people here use a phone book? Anybody use a phone book in the last month? We got one person, two, two people, okay. So, so what's interesting is that the GI generation are the heavy users of this, okay? And then the silent generation is using it, but pretty much Another generation turns, this is gone, okay? And it's gone to where? It's gone to the internet. We Google things, okay? So traditionally, 
advertising worked this way. You, 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 you placed an ad like Tom back in 1939, <laughs> placed an ad in this book, and then uh, he would advertise, okay, in the newspaper, and maybe radio, and he would drive people to his business, create awareness for his business. And so today, traditional media, all these vehicles that deliver content still exist, newspaper, telephones, radio, you know, TV. But back then, it was pretty basic. Radio reached 70 million people on a, a Sunday night. 70 million listeners on a Sunday night. So, so that was 83% of all households. So what's really interesting, today, this device just happens to reach and penetrate, I should say, 83% of households. So the difference is that these devices that deliver content haven't changed in the sense that Content is basically the same. News comes from newspapers, it's transitioning online. Subscribers are dying off because the silent generation and the greatest generation are going by the wayside. And, and, and the young people don't read newspapers, okay? So this is dying off. It's going to the internet. Radio is still alive and well. There's 1,100 terrestrial radio stations out there broadcasting. Uh, over the air. Carrie Hamill will be happy to know that because she started out in radio. And, and, and so, um, but the delivery is changing. It's got Spotify, you've got uh, Pandora, it's all changing. So, but content is king and as long as newspapers provi provide great content, people will subscribe. They're challenged because their ad revenue is being undermined by, uh, you know, different online uh, uh, help wanted services. Uh, people are using, you know, uh, um, Craigslist. They're using uh, ZipRecruiter. They're using Indeed. A lot of different places. And so newspaper readership is shrinking because of that. But it's still relevant. It reaches a more affluent demographic. So we chase, we chase demographics. You know, in America, we've got roughly 29 million people that are in the silent generation, and they have wealth. We chase that demographic. And, and they are a product of their media habits from when they grew up, and we, we, we are all creatures of habit. So the boomer generation is about 65 million. It's the wealthiest generation. You know, they have more, they have 70% of the, the money in the United States. And part of that money has come from inheriting it from the silent generation. As, as advertising agencies, we chase the demographics. And so it illustrates, as the different generations die off, their media habits, you know, die off. And, and so there are people that listen to radio today, but most of the people that listen to, to terrestrial, over-the-air radio are listening to it in their cars. And, and so it still exists because of that. It exists in the third world. One of the ways you can reach the third world in underdeveloped countries is with radio. They still use radio heavy duty. Across the border here, 50 miles away, radio is still alive and well. It's, it's, a, it's an effective way to reach people. So, but where I'm going with all this is that all these vehicles deliver content. News, sports, entertainment. You know, this is a directory. This is music mostly in news and in, in all kinds of entertainment on the television. So you can get all of that today on the internet. It's all gravitating towards the internet. And so, you know, today we look at the future generations. We look at the generation, you know, Y and Z, kids that are 25 or, 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 or 18 to 24, that, that demographic, coupled with the Generation Z, the younger kids, they're gonna represent roughly 75 million people eventually. So we're chasing that demographic. So those people, you know, are using these devices, none of these devices. They don't watch, t you know, young kids don't watch traditional TV shows and traditional TV. They don't listen to traditional radio. Um, so, 
you know, you look at, at Instagram, you look at Snapchat, you know, that demographic of 25 to, uh, or 18 to 25, 24, that demographic is actually, you know, heavy users of Snapchat, heavy users of Instagram. It runs about 74 to 78% on those two things. So if you're chasing that demographic, that young demographic, that's a, that's a place where you're gonna find those people. Facebook, you know, for the you know, younger demographic, and I'm talking about uh, the Gen Y and the Gen Z kids, you know, Facebook's kind of cool because my generation's on Facebook. But 70% of the country, you know, adults are on Facebook and YouTube, okay? And it's, it's, it, it exists because it's content driven. And it also uses something the phone has where you can contact people and, and, and socialize with people. But, you know, it's a, a content driven media. And, it, and it's incredible because most of the content Facebook didn't pay for. You know, the, the users put that content on there. So, you know, if you're looking for a way to reach, you know, across, the, you know, a broad demographic, Facebook's the way to do it. You know, people that are probably 70 years older, they get, they're less users of Facebook. Although I've got an 84-year-old mother and she doesn't read the newspaper. She's on Facebook and Apple News all day long. Sending me, sending me, you know, news stories. So it, it's it's really it's it's really interesting. Facebook and, and YouTube today are really in, in my business. We use it the most. I know a lot of you have businesses, and you know that's a foreign thing to you. You know, we do Tom's Hacienda. Tom, they've been kind of in and out of Facebook, um, trying to get him to go back to more Facebook. But he's got an older at Hacienda. He's got a little bit. Uh, Hacienda Damas, he has a little bit older demographic, and we use print and radio, okay? And so, you know, in the old days, we drove, you know, people to the phone book. Um, we drove them to the businesses, you know, using, you know, the traditional media. This is, this is really a phenomenon that is, is interesting. I used to measure a lot of this stuff for clients back in the 80s, and I had a client that we would show them the research, and the phone book would be way up here, the yellow pages, and... And he says, well, we gotta put more ads in, 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 in the phone book. I said, no, look at, the, look at the whole trend here. When you're on TV and radio, and you're in the shopper papers, the thrifty nickels, your telephone spikes, your yellow pages spike, okay? When you're off, we would flight things, we'd be off, it would go down, okay? So it, that's what drives traditional media still today, reaches all, broad, the broad you know, spectrum of these demographics. The boomers are still listening to radio, they're still watching TV. Um, uh, the, you know, some of them are still reading the newspaper, the silent generation's hardcore newspaper readers. But, but it drives people you know, into the businesses. So today, you know, the digital media does the same thing. And so Facebook, is part of Jessica's here at my office. Facebook does the same thing. YouTube does the same thing. It's just another way to, to create reach. So you've got, with your business, you've got one media, like newspaper, and it reaches this many people. You add a second media, like radio, it reaches a bigger group of people. And you add Facebook, and it's a bigger group of people. So that's the kind of mix that we do for Hacienda, a typical business here in town. And so that's their reach. And so advertising works through reach and frequency of message, okay? And it takes the frequency for the ad message to seed itself, okay? So today, that same phenomenon that went on with Yellow Pages in the 80s goes on with our, our websites. So remember what I said, content, content's king. So today, most businesses have a website. So the content on your website is really some of the most important stuff you can have. Because we are driving consumers to those websites, like we drove them to the Yellow Page phone book years ago. But it's much more, you have much more of opportunity to position yourself, your business, to, to say this is who I am compared to, you know, Tom can say this is who I am compared to, you know, this restaurant or this restaurant. Um, you know, we came up with the theme Hacienda style because they have a whole style to seafood, surf, turf, seafood, and Mexican. So it's Hacienda style. So 
So today, the traditional media, along with the digital media, the social media, drives people to the websites or in the business, drives them up through the door of the business. So in the automotive industry, we do Borman. We've done Borman for uh, you know 30 years. This is really interesting. This is a this is a, a, a company where they get 12,000 visitors a week, you know, sometimes to their website, seven to 12,000 visitors. So. The, the, they're, they're big enough to where they use television, which is a big reach media, okay? We get two-thirds of El Paso, and we get one-third of the rest of southern New Mexico when we do this, okay? And so today, you know, people walk into a showroom after they've been on a website, and the content on that website and other dealers' websites helps them decide where they're going to buy. And they do it all on the, on the internet, basically. So five years ago, the average shopper went to five to six car dealerships, okay? So today, the technology allows people to find the make, the model, the equipment, you know, uh, a lot of it. They can negotiate online if they wish. And so today, we see in a car dealership, one and a half people. Uh, or, or we should see them shopping one and a half dealerships on average. So, so that's changed the whole paradigm. I mean, that's changed the whole paradigm. And it, it, it illustrates how important your online presence is becoming. It depends on your business, but in the car business, restaurant business where you're offering entertainment, that type of thing, you know, we're driving people to that website. You know, so 50% of the people that shop for a car today, they, they won't go to the web, or they, they'll go to the website, they'll do all their shopping, and then they just walk in the door, okay? So traditional media is alive, it's well, it, uh, it's, it's changing, the delivery methods are changing. Television um, is being fragmented onto the, you know, uh, streaming media, and you've got Hulu, you've got, uh, Sling and other methods of, of delivering, you know, more of a, a menu type program. Uh, you've got millennials going towards that kind of programming. You've got Netflix, you've got uh, um, Amazon Prime. All of that stuff is, is emerging and fragmenting uh, the, the, the traditional media paradigms. But it's all about content. Content is king. And so we chase the demographics. Um, as they change, and we're mindful of that, but you know, in a market like this, you know, you really have to pay attention to a great website with lots of great content, a relevant website. I'll share, uh, you know, this story with you. I, I felt like an old guy, you know, 10 years ago, so I felt like I needed, with my hobby of collecting radios, to start a website, so I did that. I have a really rare radio. There's only 350 that exist in the world. There's only 54 that have ever been found, and uh, so I did a whole website on the history of this radio, the history of these high-end radios, because it was a rich man's radio. In 1935, it sold for $750, okay? And so I, I just created this website with all this content, with history, depression, radio, all the stuff that reflects my passion of collecting. And after 10 years, that website had over a million visitors to it and I didn't spend any money. And the reason that I had so much traffic is because I picked a very narrow niche where there wasn't a lot of information on the web about it, okay? But I, I packed it with content, and I packed it with really great visual pictures. And some of those pictures are in the, uh, the Chicago Art Deco book that just got published because they found me on the internet, okay? So, but the point I'm gonna make here is the content on your website is so important and you should fuss over it and you should update it and you should change the, you know, try to put video, try to put stills and, and really make yourself relevant uh, geographically if you're servicing El Paso and, and Silver City and all those kinds of things because the way it works today is the search engines, they, they search your site, they call it crawling and they look at the content and they look at the relative content and they decide if you've got enough relevant different content 
you know, uh, then they give you preferences. They give you a better ranking. That's how you get to the page one and that type of stuff. And this is really, a lot of you know this kind of stuff. But I'm just going to tell you the content is, is so important today because that, for a small business that can't advertise a whole lot, you get your organic types of searches going and you get to that first page. And that's, that's so important today. But, um, you know, social media, it's, it's a tough one. It works for some of our clients. Some of our clients, it doesn't work as well. But uh, with a car dealer, you put new products, you get a Ford Ranger comes and it's brand new and there, you got five of them and people really want those. We put it up on Facebook and let people know we have it, they're hard to get, they go away. That's a real simple example. But car dealers have a really kind of tough image. They, they you know, because of the negotiation and all that kind of thing in their industry, people, they would rather, you know, they like car dealers about as much as getting a root canal. I hope there's no dentist here that I offend anybody. But, uh, so, people really use technology to avoid going into car dealerships as part of what's going on. But, you know, the most important thing here is, is car dealers have a lot of inventory and a lot of content, and so their websites have to be very relevant and they're very competitive because a lot of other dealers have a lot of inventory and a lot of content. And so, you know, you really focus on trying to get your websites to the point where they really communicate a very good message that makes you different than your competition and, and displays your, your inventory in a way that you get credit for it when, the, when your, uh, uh, your website's up. So, um, Really interesting, um, and I'll just kind of wind it down here and we'll go to the panel discussion, but, you know, it's, traditional media is still relevant. It still drives people to, you know, businesses and websites. And it's changing, as you, and hopefully through the analysis I've made, you, you're slowly gonna see some of this stuff drop off. Phone, phone books will be gone, another generation change. They'll be gone. Uh, newspapers. You know, I pray for the newspaper here because I, 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 I think newspaper is really important to our communities, local newspapers. Um, they, they shed light on government and other entities. They're kind of the truth keepers. Um, the problem that they have is they're losing all that online uh, classified revenue and it's undermining their business model and they're having to cut their staffs and so content's king and they can't generate the content they used to be able to generate. And so we may lose our local newspaper voice. That's kind of a scary thought. Unless, you know, bloggers come in and people come in and start doing local news on their own. That may happen, that still may happen. But um, newspaper, you know, Sun News, you know, probably six, seven years ago, 23,000 Sunday circulation. Does anybody know what the Sun News circulation is on Sunday now? It's 11,000. It's scary, it's scary. So, newspapers fighting hard to transition to, uh, to the, the, the digital world, and it's really content, you know, if I were gonna be critical of Gannett and all their newspapers they own in southern New Mexico, they try to put too much USA Today content in there, and we're losing the local relevant content. The good stuff that people can't find anywhere else. So, it's, it's a challenge. Newspapers probably challenge the most in all this technology. Radio and television will survive because they work well in streaming media online and their content is still very, very much, in, you know, goes cross-generational. So, that, that you'll just see probably, you know, a couple more generation turns, and technology is gonna change. You know, we have a spaceport out here, and the commercial space industry is working really hard to get the cost of launching satellites into space. And very soon, we will have what are called cube satellites, um, uh, that, that are, that, that they exist today, they're small satellites, they're million dollar, two million dollar satellites, cube satellites, and NASA's already mapped where all these satellites should go, and as soon as we can get enough people that can deliver it, deliver it cheap, we're gonna put all these, these, these satellites out there, and it'll be a way to connect the whole world to the internet, okay? We won't have cell towers. It'll all be done off of these satellites, you know, today we launch a satellite, it's millions and millions of dollars to do that. They have to stay up there for a really long time, and the day they launch them, they're obsolete. But, you know, a lot of people don't know this. Google was out at the spaceport, and they were testing a, 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 a solar drone, and the whole premise of that technology was to fly it over Africa and the third world 
so they could beam the internet off of those drones, okay? So that's probably not gonna happen. They've kind of abandoned that project, but probably what's gonna happen is that we're gonna have all of these smaller CubeSats and other communication satellites. They have a shorter life, they don't cost a whole lot, and the technology burns up after a few years and they just launch another one up there. But we will eventually connect the whole world in our country with these smaller satellites. And that's why the commercial space industry is so exciting. It's exciting that we have a spaceport that's right in the middle of that because eventually broadcast television and broadcast radio over the air will go away. And it'll be streamed off the internet. I, I sat in a, a lecture this weekend because I'm a member of the Radio Collectors of New Mexico. It's a real nerdy deal with a lot of engineers from White Sands and Los Alamos. And I like to hang out with people that are physicists. But we had ham operators, you know, two-way radio guys or hobbyists that talk to each other. And ham radios are off the grid. If we lose all our cell phone communications, the only guys who are going to be talking out there are going to be the guys on the ham radios because they're independent of the grid. And I didn't know this, but they gave a presentation of how ham operators are able to go to satellite link-ups and talk off of satellites around the country. And that's going to be a growing phenomenon. So that may end up being some form of communication that, that go, goes with what we have today. But anyway, I'll leave it at that, and we'll go to our panelists, and they can talk in depth about marketing and uh, social and digital media. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. I think we all came expecting to hear about marketing. I didn't know we would get such a good history lesson. Dave, we, uh, we really appreciate uh, all of the, the background and the, the props and the show and tell. And uh, Dave will be here and uh, help us out with some Q&A toward the end. Uh, what I would ask from the audience, I suspect there will be some questions as we go along. Uh, if you'll save those questions, we plan to make time at the end. Uh, whether it's a question for Dave or one of the panelists. So uh, uh, please uh, be on the lookout for things you'd like to ask more about. Let me, uh, let me introduce uh, our three panelists and have them uh, start making their way up here. The first panelist is Teresa Dahl Brindine. Teresa owns the Little Toad Creek Brewery and Distillery with her husband, David Crosley. Uh, as a co-owner, Teresa manages events, marketing, and growth. She is also the company handy woman. Uh, as co-founders, Teresa and David started working out a, of a garage-sized brew house and eventually expanded into a large-scale production facility. In 2018, they opened a tasting room uh, here in uh, downtown Las Cruces. She holds a performance degree from Yale University and has served as the artistic director of Virus Theater since 1997. Let's welcome Teresa. Next, I'll introduce Ariana Parsons. Uh, she is the co-owner of Beck's Coffee, and she's principal of Parsons Consulting. Uh, she served for three years as executive director of the Downtown Las Cruces Partnership, which is the city's partnering agency in downtown revitalization efforts. Uh, she has served on numerous boards, committees, and panels focused on economic vitality, entrepreneurship, and community building. She spends her days growing her business and uh, on top of all of that, raising her two young sons, ages two and three months. Let's welcome Ariana. And then we have Isabella Petticone. Isabella is the marketing manager for uh, Sinuet Media, a full service marketing and digital communications agency right here in Mesilla. Uh, she didn't have too far to come. Uh, she is an NMSU grad and holds a bachelor's in business administration with a major in marketing. She previously handled marketing for an international manufacturing and distribution company. She's previously worked in production development for DirecTV headquarters. And at her media company, she's committed to helping clients grow their digital footprint and increase their sales by leveraging technology and marketing analytics. Let's welcome Isabella. good to have all three of you here. Uh, while everyone's getting settled in, uh, I want to extend my thanks uh, to the city. 
Uh, as Dr. Martinez, she's uh, still here in the back. Uh, thank you, uh, Cruz Ramos. Uh, really did a lot of heavy lifting uh, to get this organized. I wanted to say some thank yous so we don't forget at the end. Uh, Donald here, and we have other staff from the city. Uh, one of the things that we're excited about with these boot camps is it really is a, a private-public partnership. And I think we would all agree we want and need to see more of that. So uh, thanks to all of the city. And uh, Dr. Martinez, if you'll pass along our thanks to, to Stuart Ede, our, our city manager, and uh, to Phil uh, Sanfilippo, uh, we're, we're really glad to uh, be a part of, of this. Uh, let me uh, just outline quickly the plan and the format for the remainder of the program. Uh, with a presentation that we heard from Dave, uh, he really set a good foundation for us. We want to get some additional perspectives and really try to get a little more granular uh, in, in terms of these three topics that we've identified. And again, at the end, we'll open it up for questions. Uh, just a quick reminder in terms of our purpose and objective in, in these boot camps uh, is really twofold. One, we, we want to make sure we create some value for those of you uh, that took the time to come today. Uh, some value in addition uh, to the, the good La Postal lunch. Uh, you've already got a, a good taste from, uh, from Dave, and, and I'm confident you'll have some other value uh, as we work through. And we also want to create some awareness. Uh, there's no way in a short time period like this that we can answer and resolve all the issues. But uh, what we may have happened during this is we identify some things that, uh, whether it's public or private or the two of us working together, uh, have something that we can take away and, and address uh, after the, the boot camp. So uh, let's get right into some of the, the panelist discussions. The first topic uh, you'll see on your program there uh, is just the general topic of marketing. And the more I list, listen to Dave, uh, the more expansive I realize this whole idea of of marketing is. Uh, Teresa, let's start with you and, and maybe a, a good way to start since you have been, yes Dave? Uh, everybody push their button here to turn their mics on. Okay. Their little button right here, the white button. All right, great, thanks. He's keeping us on the technology. Uh, it would be interesting, I think, for the group to hear, Teresa, uh, you've been in Silver City and you've been in Las Cruces. Just talk a little bit about what uh, you have done and what you plan to do in the way of marketing and has there been a difference between the two markets that you're in? Sure. Um, yes, we started our business seven years ago, my husband and I in Silver City, and um, we were the sort of entrepreneurs who had a great idea and then dove in without really the knowledge or resources or forethought. Um, and you have to learn everything as you go when you do that. So it was a little too late for a marketing degree uh, at that point, and I sure wished I had taken a business class, but too late for that. You're in it, and you sort of have to figure out what works and what doesn't work. Um, so the, for the, the point of view of marketing, uh, that fell to me. I, um, I did theater my whole life, and so it came really natural to use events as a, as a model for marketing. Uh, we asked ourselves, who do we want to be? And the answer that we both agreed on is, we want to be the most fun place in town, and we want everyone to feel like they belong. So that is what we are selling, fun and belonging. Beer is really important, but you can drink beer at home. And we need to get people out and moving about and coming back and wanting to be a part of this experience that we're creating. So we came up with, um, uh, events our first year, I think one of our first events was Oktoberfest, and I said, hey, let's get all of my friends in Bavarian dance costumes, and we'll put on a show, learn how to dance, and close off the street, and have a keg toss, and a yodeling contest, and um, you know all these great things that I think are so much fun. Somebody else is going to find this fun as well. And this sort of developed into every holiday, we would come up with events, um, weekly music events, and I discovered that this was our marketing plan. I didn't really intend it to start that way, but all of a sudden you have something that you're not selling, you're giving away. 90% of our events are free, and so getting online, creating a Facebook event, publishing it on the local free calendars, um, and you're, all you're doing is asking people, show up and have fun with us, and selling beer is a byproduct of that. So for us, that has been a really great strategy, and I would say that at this point, that's been about 
Um, 80 percent of our marketing strategy is marketing events. It's a way to get people engaged without cramming something down their throat, without actually feeling like you're selling something to them. Um, we are right now, for the first time in seven years, about to hire our first full-time marketing person, and I'm ecstatic about that, and I'm sure that our marketing strategy will develop and grow. I know there's been some holes in what we're doing, so this is an exciting moment for us that I get to replace myself in that role. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Great. Well, th thank you. Uh, uh, fun and belonging. I mean, who, who can argue with that? Uh, <laughs> and, and by the way, you, you sell some product along the way. Uh, it's an interesting approach. Uh, Ariana, you, you're also in the beverage business, a uh, different beverage, and also have your consulting company. Uh, what, what would you add in terms of just your perspective and thoughts on uh, marketing both products and services? I, I think it's really interesting, um, and I, I like what Teresa says because, well, one, her Mardi Gras party uh, last week was really fun, just so you know. If you don't Please go to their events because they are a really good time. They have uh, they have a really good showing, and um, I, it's interesting to me because you cannot force me to put on an event. It is like my it's my least favorite thing to do. Um, so you really have to figure out for your business what your what your strategy is, and um, we have you know, very, very different strategy uh, there. Um, we tried to do some events over at Bex. We do music series and we do some, uh, we have some galleries, um, some artists that, that put up their works, but it's different. I mean, it's a different atmosphere because we're selling, uh, you know, we're more geared towards mornings and um, definitely beer helps with events, um, I would say. That's, <laughs> that's a legitimate thing. Um, we, the way, just in general, the way that we look at marketing is that it is an opportunity to have an ongoing conversation with your customer base. Um, we really like to tell our story every day, and I think that that's, uh, social media for us is a really good way to do that. It's kind of, uh, we use our social media as kind of a, a behind the scenes look at, at coffee and coffee roasting and coffee brewing. And it turns out that our, our staff, they're really, really marvelous at um, being brand ambassadors for us. They love what they do, they're passionate about what they do, and they tell that story too. I'm not in the coffee shop as much as I would like to be these days days because I have two little babies who do not need more caffeine um, so I try and keep them away especially when Ty's roasting but um, our staff is really kind of taking it on and they will take pictures of the work they're doing or if they think they made a really beautiful latte they will post that on to Instagram and so they're great brand ambassadors but again uh, for us it's just continuing that uh, it's an ongoing conversation about who we are the story that we're telling and why you know why they should come in and, and be a part of that experience great well I, uh, two things that, that caught my ear there is you talked more than once about having conversations and telling the story. Mm -hmm. And I, I think whether it's, as we listen today with all the different uh, approaches over the years, that's, that's what everyone was really trying to do is, is have that conversation and, and tell their story. So uh, th thanks for those insights. So Isabella, we've, we've heard from a couple of, of users and, and you're actually in the business of uh, helping users. Uh, what, what can you add in, in terms of perspective on marketing in general? Yeah, so I think both Teresa and Ariana touched on some things that are really important for business owners to take away, which is that when both of them sat down to figure out how they wanted to approach their marketing, they looked at their overall goal, their branding. Um, these, are, these are all questions that business owners should ask themselves too as they start to develop their marketing strategy. What do I want to communicate? Who do I want to be, as Teresa said? Um, and, and then, from that and who do I want to reach? Because who am I as a business and who do I want to reach? Um, so these are all questions that are important to identify before you start to build your marketing strategy, but I think those are excellent first steps. Good, yeah. and, and I, I think all three of our panelists have used that word strategy. Uh, it's, it's a word that nearly gets overused, but I, I think with, with marketing, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a definite. Uh, you actually want to think ahead uh, to what uh, what you want to do in terms of a, a plan mm -hmm. going forward. Before we leave marketing, uh, let me just ask each of you, if you fast forward five years from now, 10 years from now, how do you think your approach 
uh, to marketing may change, but based on what you you know today, Teresa, any any thoughts on how how your approach may uh, need to be adapted? Um, I I think it's it it really falls in line with the growth of our company. Um, we're finally getting to the point where we're going to be more focused on our products, on canning our beer, and that will add a whole another layer to the marketing. So. Um, developing a sense of identity for the beer and a connection to the actual the brand of the beer will be just a, a different layer for depending us. on how your company grows yeah okay Ariana yeah I think that's that's extremely accurate I think as your company grows you have to adapt and uh, it, one of the things that's really wonderful about social media is that it can be a two-way conversation uh, people can you know there's so many comments and and you can get that feedback it's an instantaneous feedback and you have to just really be open to listening to the feedback to guide that growth because um, at what other stage I mean certainly when we were doing radio and, and newspaper you could put something out there and you didn't have that immediate feedback of oh I really like this or this is really working for me or this is really engaging so as you um, as you continue to grow and hopefully we want to grow as a brand um, then you you get that feedback and, and you kind of roll with what that feedback from the community is so yeah so building the brand yeah. and you really have to monitor that along the way to know what it looks like mm -hmm. so Isabella as you think of how might you uh, consult and, uh, and and counsel with uh, customers five years ten years from now yeah so I think one of the things you know Dave was talking about when he was presenting was how technology plays a role in the way that we communicate our marketing and so I think taking into account and staying on top of trends with that is an important way to adapt um, all of your marketing ventures as you move forward with your business and then something that I know you guys kind of touched on right now um, is tracking to adapt your marketing efforts that's so important, you know, Ariana mentioned getting feedback from the community, but especially uh, this is where digital components might come into your marketing strategy if you have a website. Looking at analytics, um, seeing where people are coming in and um, content is important. So what kind of po content is getting people to interact with our business more? Um, what are they interested in? So all of these things should be tracked and I think digital spaces can help do that uh, more and more as we progress in time. Well, that's a perfect segue into our next topic around social uh, media. And as I listen to this and as we all listen to Dave, I was reminded of the old adage, the only constant is change. Uh, when you see the changes that Dave outlined to us and just some of the comments uh, that marketing, you know, five to 10 years from now will, will be delivered differently than it is now. But uh, Isabella, let's uh, hear from you about uh, your, your thoughts on social media. Uh, you've probably worked with different types of businesses that are targeting several of you've talked about knowing your audience. Uh, kick us off on this topic of social media and how some of those conversations go with your customers. Yeah, so social media is a very ever-changing animal. I mean, even as a marketer, um, it's hard for us, it's a challenge for us and something that we always have to stay on top of as all the different platforms change their algorithms regularly. So how you might be marketing your business on, let's say, Facebook today might not necessarily be as efficient next month. Um, and it, again, it depends on what the platform is doing, how it's developing. Um, and so something that's important to sort of help manage how you use social media is to stay on trend, to look at news articles, look at the uh, platform's policies and regulations as they change. Um, they have, the policies change too, the way that we use advertisement on uh, social media platforms, they have specific guidelines. Um, and also as they start to merge, you know, Facebook bought Instagram, so how is that affecting how your ads or how your posts are going out to people? So I think the most important thing is to stay on top of how social media is working and how you can use it to optimize whatever content it is that you're pushing out as much as possible. 
Um, and to use strategy. So it kind of ties back into general marketing, right? Like as you come up with your strategy of how you want to uh, evolve your communications and create your messaging, um, sort of how to optimize that messaging on social media, share the content that's most relevant to people, and ensure that you're targeting that content to the people you want to reach. And I'm expecting that that needs to be customized from one customer to the next. Certainly, yeah. So, you know, with our clients, first thing we do and we sit down with them and a lot of them come to us just saying, I know I have to be on social media, but I don't know which platform or what to do or how to manage this. And so um, the content part is very customizable. Um, basically, you look at the business and you try to identify um, you know, what specific messaging might be key? What What's their differentiating factor? And let's push that out. Perhaps um, putting the different content into specific categories that are relevant to your audience is a good way to help develop content as well. Um, so it doesn't really matter what your industry is, but if you're able to do those things, that part you can customize on your own based off what you know about your business. Great, thank you. So Ariana, whether it's Bex or whether it's Parsons Consulting, uh, some of your thoughts around this uh, ubiquitous social media that uh, none of us can get away from. It's part of our life these days. I love social media. I think it's, <laughs> I think it's super fun. Um, one of the things that I was, when I was thinking about social media in general, I was thinking about um, how I've seen, um, I think we just got back on Instagram like a year ago. <laughs> that was awful to say. But uh, we're kind of back on that, and I've seen Instagram really change even in the past year or two years. It used to be, so it kind of went through this phase, right? So you had... Um, you d I'm sorry, thank you. Uh, you knew that um, you had to be on Instagram and that images are very appealing, but it's really gotten to a point where there are there's a whole new industry just around product photography now because not only do you have to have engaging posts but now they have to be really pretty so um you know one of those things that you have to talk about or you have to budget for is hiring a really good product photographer because we all have really good phones and for a minute there that was enough for a minute, we could take a picture of our own product and post it, but it's gotten super, super professional. So um, you can, I'm, we have some great resources right here in our own community for amazing product photographers, and those shoots are really fun. Um, and then you probably get to eat and drink a lot of the things that you're photographing too. So, um, so that's fun. When we have when we do an ice cream photo shoot, people like to show up and, and be a part of that. So, um, you know, staying on top of those trends and watching where it goes and, and being really diligent about monitoring other pages and, and deciding what you like, what's catching your eye when you are browsing on these platforms, and then trying to integrate some of that into your own uh, business. I think. Is really important. Good. Well, we've got some common themes here: uh, eating, drinking, mm -hmm. uh, taking pictures, mm -hmm. uh, all, all things that are fun. So, uh, who knew marketing could be so much fun? Uh, Teresa, your thoughts on social media? I expect uh, you're you're in this arena as well. Talk to us about that. Um, social media is so key, and I find it very challenging in our business. Uh, we use it a lot, and um, I try in that sort of in that spirit of of you want to be engaging, you want to be having a conversation, you don't want to be just putting static images that you're pushing out at the public. Um, so we try to engage our staff and certainly our management in both locations in um, in posting a certain amount of social media posts on a regular basis. But one the challenge that we found with that with multiple people putting posts out is the the continuity, the the sort of sense of identity of who is Little Toad Creek? This manager posts things that are more in her personality. This uh, manager insists on using this font which doesn't really match our our logo. Um, so so trying to find that consistency while using different uh, different people to post. And I think that's where this is going to come in very, very handy right about now that we're hiring somebody to be in charge of that and to really um, control the content, monitor the content, set some guidelines company-wide um, to make sure that there's consistency across all of our social media. Well, I, I think it, uh, it, it speaks to the importance of marketing. Uh, as you listen to Teresa, here is an entrepreneur, small business, 
and marketing is important enough that that's the next add to your staff. So I, I think that speaks volume. Tom, do you have something you want yeah, to add on know, this? I, I, you I, caught I, a little smirk. Yeah, I know you, you've got something <laughs> on your mind. I was Let's thinking to Ariana's <laughs> comment regarding instantaneous feedback. You know, social media has, it's a two-edged sword. Uh, it's a wonderful way to uh, 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 engage a certain demographic uh, and, it's, and it's working. And as the younger guy on the panel here, uh, where there's been some reluctance, uh, you know, I have younger staff that's pushing me in the right direction. But I got to tell you a quick story. Um, part of the, the other edge of the social media that I want to speak to for a second is the feedback. Uh, there was one time not too long ago in one of my dining rooms where apparently we were a little slow on delivering a, an alcoholic beverage. So this person, rather than engaging my manager or my server, decided to, to pound out a Facebook post. Uh, the post is a little slow, and I forget exactly what it said. So I've got someone that monitors Facebook uh, activity almost 24-7. I get a call. I'm off-site. Uh, we're getting hammered on a delivery in one of our dining rooms on, a, on an alcoholic beverage. In, I real, call, in real time. In real time. I, uh, I get off the phone. I call my manager. He shows up to that table almost before the Facebook post was, was made and said, is there something we can help you with? My point, my point in sharing this with you is it's an interesting dynamic right now because some folks are more comfortable with pounding out a Facebook uh, issue or complaint or, or communication versus having a face-to-face -face engagement, which, you know, in my generation, that's what we do. I, that's what I'm comfortable with. Um, so I'm, t I'm, I'm learning a little bit about that and how um, that customer demographic uh, reaches out to me. And, and as a result, I have someone that kind of keeps an eye on it all the time because uh, it can be pretty damaging if you don't react fairly quick. Those Facebook uh, posts stay way too long sometimes. <laughs> but it also allows you to immediately address it. It does, yeah. Uh, where in, in the past that wasn't something that, that could happen. That's correct. Great, yeah, if I can story. add to that of a course. little bit, um, I think that as, as much as we're all going to experience that you know that they say that if you have a good experience you tell two people mm -hmm. if you have a bad experience you tell everyone you know right, right. so um, that is definitely something that we deal with in all of our industries I'm sure but it's also a real opportunity if you can learn how to be really good at um, taking care of those you know just like that if, if you can have your manager over there taking care of it if you can make a sincere apology and if you can say okay let's look let's look internally and see if we did something are our processes off or is this policy off um, that's a really great opportunity for your business to change and to grow I will say that if I ever see any one of you post a three-star review with no comments on uh, yeah. Google or <laughs> Facebook, um, yeah, you're gonna, I'm going to slap your hand. Uh, <laughs> that gives absolutely no feedback to anyone. It is just, you know, you're just right. going like, meh, yeah. like, thanks. That, that was awesome. Well, um, yeah. So it's still really important. We're a small community, so if you want to uh, help your businesses in your community grow, still talk to the management, um, talk to the staff. That's, what the, that's the great part about small business, right, is you have that access to the people making decisions, and you can really help them uh, to improve their business. So. Uh, it, it's a great point, and Dave talked so much uh, during his presentation about content, and now we're even hearing in feedback there needs to be content mm -hmm. and yeah. and so as I listen to, to all of you and I think about the content there's that combination and and that balance between what I was hearing is both images uh, and text and so which one is the most effective so Isabella you have additional comments yeah I mean I think good points were brought up just now about using social media as a platform t for customer relationship yeah. management um, and that's something that we're starting to see a lot with our clients as well, um, especially the ones that are national. You know, you get lots of complaints or comments maybe um, from time to time, either in Messenger or publicly. Um, and so when things like that happen, because it happens to all businesses, um, it's important to understand or to, to set up a policy uh, for your business about how you want to respond to these people. Um, the number one thing that we like to tell our clients is, you need to get them off the public space. So um, that way you're able to freely sort of communicate and rectify the situation or you figure something out with that customer without it being public information for everyone. Um, and so that's something that should 
be happening always is, is if you receive something publicly either on Facebook or Yelp, um, which you should all be registered under, you should all have your Yelp um, for feedback purposes and things like that, um, and also to help find you. Um, but if, if you have that, to monitor that regularly. Don't let a comment sit there for a week or two. You do respond as soon as possible. Take them off the public space and try to address the problem pri privately. So yeah. I just wanted to sort of say that because I know that that's a common issue that happens with all businesses. Well, th this is obviously a topic that everyone knows about and, and clearly there's a lot of thinking behind it. Any other comments on social media? We can, we can circle back to it, but anything else from any of you? As, as I think about the, the social media, what, what comes to mind for me is the importance of adjusting and adapting. If you think about the, the comments here, uh, whether it's real-time response or whether it's the growth of your company, uh, I think there's a need to adapt and adjust. And, and I've had some experience with Dave Wilson on uh, a campaign really promoting Las Cruces as a place for people to move into. And as I've watched uh, Dave and others in that group over this last three years, that's the one thing that's that's common is we've had to continue to adjust and adapt yep. uh, just based on what we're learning. And I think that's the advantage is with this feedback, uh, we, we can say, okay, that worked, let's do more of it, or that didn't work. Uh, how do we adjust and change? And I think that's the beauty of social media. Uh, it's a challenge, but it does give us the ability to to change and do it differently if we need to. I would encourage people to be students, especially in social media arena, um, your Facebook page um, as you manage it, to be a student of what works and what doesn't work and what people respond to. I, I do a lot of Facebooking in areas of my, my personal interests and I, I kind of use it as a tool to teach myself what people are responding to and I find this content thing is again king it's really the content's really important um, and this whole deal I'm really happy to hear people talk about images um, uh, and, and, and how you present your products because the automotive industry is going through this uh, challenge right now it's really hard to get clients to do it because it's so expensive to do but I'll tell you what's going to happen here the factories are doing this reality you know service Ford's the first to launch it where every car is a virtual car and they come out and take pictures of your dealership and it's gonna be a virtual showroom where the car's a virtual car and it will be the exact color with all the equipment and everything based on a VIN number on the car. Mm -hmm. And so that's gonna solve the that's gonna solve the problem. But um, I've noticed that, you know, really good, you know, interesting content with a little bit of extra information um, um, and, and just really great images people are much more engaged to that and you know we have a saying this is an old saying uh, that one of my bosses taught me this is the most expensive commercial you'll ever run and this applies to, across all channels uh, is the one nobody pays attention to hmm. nobody pays attention to okay you know like a, a, you know if you're running a YouTube ad or a television ad you got a second and a half to get their attention or you lose them okay and so Again, the content is king, the creative, what goes behind that, the production, and it's expensive to do some of this stuff. Some stuff is not. With a phone, you can do some pretty amazing quick things uh, and respond socially and get some amazing events going on. You see, you got you know, a good social media person within a business, a person has an eye for things that are gonna play to, and understands their audience is gonna play to those people, that type of thing. So, but content you know, is just really important. And to be a student and try to understand what works and what doesn't work. Uh, there's a real art to that, take notes. Yeah, sure, so. thanks Dave. Let's move to the last topic. Uh, no business has unlimited resources. And so uh, as businesses are thinking about where do I invest and spend my marketing dollars, uh, I think we've already touched on some of that. But let's take a little deeper dive into uh, how do you best use those marketing uh, dollars. Uh, Ariana, you were on the downtown uh, partnership. Uh, you've now got uh, early two businesses of your own. Uh, kick this off for us in terms of uh, how we should be thinking about investing marketing dollars uh, with all of this in mind that we've talked about, especially around social media. 
I, I think the important thing is to take a very holistic view of uh, what it is to market your business because we can talk about just advertising dollars and we can say, you know, this is your demographic and you should go over here and this is where you should put in a couple hundred dollars. But don't forget that the best marketing you're ever going to have is people having a good experience in your business. That's absolutely the best way to have free marketing, you know. Um, good word of mouth is really, really important, especially in this community. Um, people here, it, it is a small town and, and people talk and um, people will talk to you and, and back to you. One of the things that I like to do um, with our, and I'm going to say marketing budget and that's not even fair because at no point have I ever sat down and come up with a budget for marketing. I'll be very honest with that. Um, I put money into social media and I put money to KRWG underwriting because that's, that's my client base. Um, and I know that, but it's, it's not a significant portion of our, uh, of our budget every year. But one of the things that I do like to do is I like to reward our brand ambassadors. Um, we use Square for all of our um, transactions, and one of the things, one of the features of Square is that they, people can give you feedback, positive or negative, that goes right to you. And um, I like to give anybody who sends positive feedback, I like to give them a coupon for two bucks to come get a free cup of coffee on their next visit because. They took the time out of their day to just make us feel better and to give us good feedback. And how often do you really get that in, in the world these days? So it's really nice. And so in return, we give them a little $2. It's, it's a cup of coffee, but that brings them in and it brings them in with somebody else, maybe who's being introduced. I think collaborations are really important, and we have uh, wonderful collaborations in this community. Lori Allen, um, she gives out uh, coupons to Bex for her clients' birthdays, um, and that's a really fun collaboration that we have, and we collaborate with all the downtown uh, businesses, and that's a really easy way to build each other up and to support one another, so that can be in... Um, Oregon Mountain Outfitters, we came up with a blend for them, and they, on the back of every bag, they talk about their business and our business and why we like to work together. So there are so many ways that you can do um, a lot of word of mouth and a lot of building community, um, which is bigger than just advertising your product, but really building your community, and you can do that with a very limited budget. Right. Well, and as I hear you go through that, very creative. I mean, that's thinking outside the box. What a novel idea to use some quote unquote marketing dollars back to your own customers mm -hmm. uh, to have them help you with the marketing. You're, uh, I mean, people who are your brand ambassadors, when they decide that they love you, they like, it's all, you know, it's all out for them. Yeah. And they talk about you and they tag you in posts and they bring their friends when they're in town. And yeah, I'm going to reward that a little bit and I'm going to try to build that up because that's just, it's a wonderful way to build that community. Great idea. Teresa, what can you add to that around best way to, to use marketing dollars? Um, I, we really struggle with how much money to spend on um, print and radio because it gets expensive really fast, especially when, you know, I would say that 80% of our marketing is done through social media and that's mostly free. We do a little bit of um, ad boost, uh, boosting on Facebook. But um, so when you're getting so much bang for your buck out of social media, it's really painful to drop 500 bucks on an ad. Uh, in a newspaper, but I we haven't yet abandoned newspaper and radio. We do have um, a sm allocate a small part of our budget to that just to keep in, in the presence of the people who aren't on social media all the time. And then also it allows us to, to get press releases printed in our local papers as long as we buy an ad now and then they're, they're willing to, to print stories about our events. We also consider our events part of our marketing budget, so um, that eats up a lot of our, our marketing budget, paying musicians and whatnot, but it's well worth it. That's what gets people in the door for us. Yeah, sounds like you get a good bang for your buck on those events that you've talked about. Yeah, absolutely. I Isabella, uh, as you're advising your, your clients, uh, help us with what, what you think about from a budgeting and a dollar standpoint. Yeah, so I was, I was reading an article a couple months ago about how marketing spending now has transitioned or I guess increased by 40% in the UK and in the US in the last couple years, um, which is a lot. 
Um, and a lot of that budget is coming from what people used to do is uh, media brokers. Now they're going into digital marketing and advertising space. Um, and I think that this is a, a really important trend to tell us uh, that I think is happening because of again, the analytics and what you can tell. So something that I really advise a lot of clients to do is look at the information. Um, so you don't want to spend your money blindly. You want some kind of report or analytics to help you make a judgment about how you should spend your marketing dollars, what's going to give you the biggest bang for your buck. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, the other thing, too, I think a common misconception that occurs for a lot of um, businesses in general is when you're doing well that you don't have to market anymore or you know you're doing well mm -hmm. so everything's good when in fact um, uh, often quite the opposite is true um, instead of waiting till you go back down and doing um, sort of these up and down slopes to leverage um, your momentum as you're doing well and push that forward will help propel your business to new heights so you don't have a downslope um, and move forward. So I think um, timing in your marketing spending is important, is an important factor to look into. Um, information and analytics to help you make those decisions about specifically for your business what's going to work because as Teresa is telling us, you know, she does a lot of event marketing, that works really well for her. Um, and Ariana does a lot of customer relationship like coupons and uh, rewards and things like that. Sometimes it could be a mix of that. Sometimes for your business that might not make sense. It might be something else entirely. So I think it's important to look at your market and to look at information to help you make those decisions um, and, it's, and, and look at your budget and see how to best spend it. Good ideas. Tom, we can't pass up this opportunity. You and Jereen market in different ways at, at your two restaurants. What, what thoughts could you add as you've, uh, you know, decided what you want to do going forward and how might that be different from what you did say five years ago? <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's entirely different and the guy to my left here will tell you that. Um, I've been more of a traditional marketing guy, at least thinker in the past, but I'm learning the value of, of social media and, and some of the ways we can, we can reach that we haven't reached before. Uh, it's still a little tricky. Uh, and I, I'm going to have some really good takeaways today, believe me. But when I sit down with Dave and, and the folks who helped me on La Posta, it's still not clear to me how I break up the marketing dollar. You know, I, I'm a little more educated and in the, in the, in the, the dartboard I'm throwing the dart at is a little smaller than it used to be. But um, uh, what I try to get, because uh, I'm a big metrics guy, I, got, I like numbers, I like analytics. I want feedback. I want to understand what's working the best. And, and it's really personal engagement with my customers that I really learn the most. You know, hardly any of you anymore will go to a restaurant and get a paper comment card. Right. And uh, you won't see that anymore. You might see an iPad up at Genghis Khan or something like or Applebee's uh, to give uh, some media, media feedback. But most of what we get now is, is pretty instantaneous. And, and to Ariana's point, um, we, we take, uh, we, we're always very happy with good good comments and, and good remarks and we reward them as well but it's those ones that maybe we uh, we didn't have our a game we fumbled a little bit that we choose to we turn those into opportunities uh, those are op those are opportunities to take a customer that maybe had not the best experience and make them a fan for life mm -hmm. and so uh, what social media really allows us to do is do that a lot quicker than, than the old ways before so, uh, before those bad experience fester and they tell 10 people about it to the correct. point of if they have a good experience they'll tell a couple if they have a bad experience uh, they get yeah, out with a megaphone that's correct right so. good that that's helpful let's see what questions we might have from the audience uh anyone have a, a question feedback thoughts uh i've got lights in my eyes yes the gentleman uh, right there behind richard my friend richard colfarb Yeah, I was curious to see if you guys are using um, Facebook posts versus Facebook uh, boosts, or if you're using any kind of um, online advertising. Um, and it's a two-fold question. If you are, um, how do you balance the, uh, the difference between invasive 
advertising um, versus creative. Panelist, who wants to take a stab at that? Isabella? Um, so there's sort of different messaging options on Facebook that you can look at. So you mentioned a couple, you said the content that you're just posting, the content that you're boosting, and then there's also Facebook advertising, which is sort of a separate service as well. Um, so how you separate that is really dependent from business to business, um, which is, sounds very diplomatic, but it is true. Um, for regular content that you're just posting, you're really not going to get much out of social media if you're not posting daily. If you're posting twice or three times a week, you might as well not even have I mean, I mean, you'll be listed, so that's good, but it's really not doing much for you. So I think as far as regular content, you should be posting daily, and it should be important, uh, informational, um, engaging content, um, creative content. Like, that's where you would put a lot of the creativity in because you want to draw people in as well. Um, you would also use creativity for anything you're boosting. Um, depending on your industry, so for instance, restaurants or cafes, um, you know, you might want to boost something if you're having an event. Um, or if it's a big event, you might want to do an advertisement. So it, it depends also the scale of what you're organizing or what your message is. Um, so it really depends on, on what your goal is with what, what you're posting. So I would advise you to take a look at that and sort of decide, okay, is this something I'm trying to reach a few people with because I have a small venue? Uh, is this a bigger event that I'm coordinating with the city for my business? Um, am I just trying to get people that get to my Facebook page to get to know me as a brand and be interested in my services? So those are sort of the different pockets that you should be looking at to try to decide and mitigate how you want to separate your content. Great. Additional comments on that? Teresa? Yes. Um, we, we try to post daily on um, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And what, I, what we try to do, we don't always succeed because we're all doing completely different things right now, but, but our general model is that we do one-third faces. So people, uh, a, a staff member doing something fun or holding a beer, one-third product, and then one-third events. And then the only thing that we really boost is the events. I'm not sure if that's necessarily the great strategy, but it seems, it seems to be working for us. We put money into paid boosts for our events. And what I count on is when I do a, a, a big blast, like for example, for St. Patrick's Day, I'm blasting St. Patrick's Day, but the content in there is creating an idea in people's mind that, oh, Little Toad Creek is fun. So I'm gonna go down there, you know, it, it's, it's also advertising for Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, even though the event is on Sunday. Right. Very good. Great question. Other questions? Richard? My name is Richard Colthart, publisher of the Las Cruces Bulletin, and, and my question is about numbers. It's not really a question. I'll make a statement, and you guys comment on that. So um, I deal with numbers every day. Uh, as a print newspaper, it's less – you. It's more difficult to be analytical. I mean, we, we were audited last year to show that we're distributing what we say we do. And we distribute 21,000 copies every Friday, and 95% of them are getting picked up. If, as a business person, if that wasn't being picked up at that rate, I wouldn't print them uh, that many. But, um, so, but because it is not quantifiable, definitely not as much as these digital ones, I, here's my fear and concern, as obviously I would have, but you guys talk about this. So if, if you ignore marketing opportunities because you can't define the numbers as explicitly, this a little bit applies to outdoor advertising too. They can tell you how many cars go by, but they can't tell you how many is looking at it. Um, if, you, if you leave out certain segments of marketing because it's not as quantifiable, it seems to me you, you could be missing very important audiences. So just talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so just to clarify, because I know I mentioned quantification as you start to make your spend your marketing dollars, that's a very good point. Um, and what I like to tell my clients is that it should be a combination for a lot of them. 
And what we specialize in as an agency is bridging the gap between traditional and digital. So not to say that traditional is outright not helpful at all. That's not the case. Um, and a lot of times it's perfect for a lot of our clients. And I think it depends again on the demographic that you're trying to reach, uh, what your messaging is. And if you have the budget to sort of spread across those things, you should be spreading across as many channels as you can. So I think that is an important component. Traditional marketing is not dead. It is certainly very important to a lot of clients. Um, so it just depends on your business, who you're trying to reach, and what your goals are. Once you analyze those things, it can help you sort of answer that question for yourself. Great. No, good feedback. And I think about demographics as that shifts. And Richard, I know you look at that with uh, those that uh, buy your newspaper. That that will change over time, which will probably mean some of the, the marketing needs to be shifted. Dave? So, R Richard, you know, the print media um, newspaper, um, it is, and I've talked about this earlier, it is, it's shrinking the numbers of readers. But it's a very important demographic because of the the age group that reads the newspaper um, and and they they're the ones with the big money um, and so it's critical for my you know a lot of my clients that they still be in there uh, you know we fight this battle um, with some but but it, it, it does it depends on the demographic and, and what you're selling I'm gonna tell you in the event world we just finished doing a couple of events uh, for the uh, Doniana County Arts Alliance, and and um, you know it, it, they track they track the business, and I'll share with you just the Renaissance Crafts Fair, and Richard's involved in this. We did a lot of inserts uh, with a really nice piece into surrounding markets because I'm trying to grow their uh, uh, their uh, surrounding markets. And so we also did a lot of, of Facebooking, um, um, and we've increased, you know, the, the the social media, Facebook ads, paid ads, um, but also we do the organic, uh, you know, we do the posts, and we're posting content of the art artists and the different types of things that are going to be there. But you know, in the exit research, I'm going to tell you that Facebook, you know, on the Renaissance, you know, Crafts Fair um, uh, was as big as both newspapers combined. You know, still a big, you know, you got to look at this, the pie. Here's the pie. Newspaper, and not everybody, you know, is on Facebook, older demographic, people with money. They go to these kinds of events. They spend money. But uh, radio is, is, is certainly reaching uh, the older demographic as well, and people, younger demographics, where people are listening in their cars and that type of thing. But events really get circulated through social media and and you know you you know you do an art fair you can put you know it's a great way to showcase your artists all of that is relevant to people getting them to attend in that type of stuff and it's just such a powerful powerful emerging tool that you just you can't discount it anymore it's just really a key part of the overall marketing mix but you know newspaper still stands up uh, in the scheme of things in a mix, but I use that as to give you an example of how the traditional media, if you didn't do the newspaper, you'd have a lot less people coming because a lot of those people aren't, aren't on social media enough to, to engage. But remember, 70% of the adults in America are now on Facebook and, and using YouTube. So Interesting. If Carrie, I can, I'm sorry, sure, if no, I could go right ahead, a different way to look at this perhaps, um, and one of the ways that I look at where we do spend our advertising dollars is it also depends on the price point of your product, I think, um, because for us, if we take out a $500 ad in a newspaper or on the radio, we have to sell a lot of $2 cups mm -hmm. of coffee in order to make that up. Yeah. So for us, it wouldn't really make sense, especially because we don't have those analytics saying, you know what, you got 250 people from this ad that you placed. Um, we will never know that. So that, that would be, it's a much bigger risk for us in that sense than it would be for an automobile or, or you know, an, a higher end product. Important distinction. Yeah, great. Yeah, remember, advertising works through reach, which is the combination of all those those different medias is, is what the reach is, but frequency. And in the case of the newspaper, 
It's really hard to sustain that for certain types of business, but um, but the, it works through the frequency. You know, this is an old newspaper. Richard will know this because he's been in the business a long time. But this this is a good example of illustrating reach in the old paradigm of newspaper. You know, Belden, who did the research for newspapers forever, they did a deal where they did a study. Uh, you run one full page newspaper ad, and you you reach 55 percent of the people that read the newspaper. One full page paper. Um, newspaper ad. You run a second page and you reach about 65%. And you run the third full page and you reach about 85%. And every full page after that, it's a pretty diminishing uh, return. It goes to your whole point. Now, you know, most you know, car dealers could afford to do that, but you can't if you're selling something like coffee or beer. It's hard to do that. But it illustrates how you the frequency builds builds the reach. Okay. And, and, and when you're running ads on the internet, it really works the same way, it's the same principles. Uh, so frequency is really key to that. So reach, frequency, um, combination, there's a really important thing to understand when you're planning your media and doing it. And, and you know, Isabel's comment about being consistent, man. That's one of the great villains is people aren't consistent in their messaging. You know, nobody beats us as borrow deal to toot Lucif borrow's horn, but he's been so consistent right. with that, you can't forget it. Yeah. Um, you know that's a Lucif borrow commercial, and that's a secret weapon. If you're consistent with that, people kind of half pay attention. That kind of helps you stand out in things. But, uh, um, you know, the, it's reach, frequency, and, and, and impact of message, content. So. Good. Thanks for the question, Richard. Kerry, did you have a question? I did. Um, it's actually, it's, it's a little bit more, I, I actually don't need it. Thank you, Tom. A couple of things. Thanks to Tom and the Las Cruces. It's so important for locally owned businesses to really, there, it's so important for locally owned businesses to really develop those relationships. And I appreciate the efforts that you take to develop those relationships and nurture those relationships on social media and to really try and make your customers, help your customers feel like they're part of your business and more so part of your family. So I always encourage people, like personalize that if you're working on developing content. There are a number of things. I mean, Ariana posted a picture of Thomas learning how to become a barista. Um, <laughs> you know, and it's developing that content on a regular basis and posting it, you know, at eight o'clock in the morning and at noon and maybe at four o'clock and maybe at 7.30 at night. Think about how you use your social media when you're looking at it because other people are doing the exact same thing. And so the frequent posting, trying to develop content, there are so many things that small businesses can do to generate their content from the history of the restaurant, like the ad that you've got, you know, the history of the restaurant and timelines um, of to when, uh, you know, a thought that you had for the day uh, on why you love owning a small business. All of those things are content that you can generate in your social media and post frequently and create more people to follow, to, to have people share your stuff um, and also create more awareness about your business. And so I appreciate and applaud what you do because I think your examples that I use on a regular basis when it comes down to showing perfect models of what people can do on social media. So thank you. Right, Carrie, it's a, it's a great reminder and how interesting that she's talking about people and relationships. And Tom, as I reflect on our first business boot camp, which was about leadership and culture, if there was a common theme there, it was about people and relationships. So obviously we have tools and strategies and a lot that uh, that we're doing, but uh, Carrie, I think you, you kind of, you know, bring us back full circle that uh, this is all about uh, connections that people have with each other and how do we create and maintain those connections. So uh, r really great comments, thank you. We probably got time for one more question. Yes, young lady in the back here. Okay, um, so mine's in the vein of social media as well. And maybe, Ariana, it goes toward what you were saying about developing partnerships, but have any of you used micro-influencers in this area? Micro-influencers. Ariana? I think that um, we haven't been strategic about it, but I was just thinking about that this morning. Um, you know, we have, we have bloggers who come in, and we're always happy to, um, to host them. Um, and again, I think that that plays to um, giving that little carrot incentive, you know, just a couple of dollars here um, to reward those people who become your brand ambassadors for you. Um, but we haven't specifically used micro influencers. Anyone in the audience that wants to, to comment? 
Okay, you, you win the award for stumping uh, beyond Ariana's uh, uh, comments. And now I'm going to. I'm going right. to go do it right now. Okay. All right. So you've been a catalyst. To, do, you, do you have some thoughts and comments? Uh, you, you had the question. Any, anything you'd like to share? Um, I mean, I do a lot of digital. And so I do a lot of tracking and watching my offices miss phone calls right now. So I'm constantly being updated on stuff like that. Um, I guess another big question I was having maybe for David and Isabella is we, we have multiple locations and so I'm constantly having a battle with our board about where is the best place to put our marketing dollars. Should we put it in the offices that are taking off in hopes that they'll become these great things or should we help bolster our offices that are struggling a little bit? Do you guys have any insight with companies that have multiple locations on, or on the theory of that? Yeah, so uh, we have a client in New York that, or sorry, Baltimore, that has, it's a restaurant, and they have two locations, one closer to Washington, D.C., and one um, in Baltimore. So for them, as they launched their new location recently with a lot of success, um, a lot of marketing dollars were spent on that new location for the launch. And then afterwards, um, for them, they sort of split their marketing dollars equally between their uh, their older location and their, their newer one. Um, so I think there's a lot of factors that come into trying to make that decision. Um, but that's, that's just an example that I have that we've done for them. Um, the other thing to think about, too, is if you're promoting your new um, location, uh, try to look at, to try to mitigate some of the spending as well. Look at some free options. Um, things like getting listed on multiple platforms, not just Yelp, but other review sites. Um, making sure your, your SEO optimized on the new site for your new restaurant, or if it's a shared um, page, or if it's a, on, on the same website, that that specific page announcing uh, your launch is is optimized and that you're driving traffic there. So I think um, there's really a lot of things you'd have to look at, and I'd be happy to speak with you later if you're interested, um, to look at before making that decision. But those are some options I have seen. Great. Thank you. Any last, last few comments? Teresa? Oh, just quickly, um, we, we have two locations and um, our budget, our marketing budget for Las Cruces is actually double our marketing budget for Silver City. And I, I think just sort of looking at what, how each of those locations is made up and what the draw is. In Silver City, we have a restaurant and that draws people there. So we don't have to spend as much effort getting people in the door. Where in Las Cruces, we have to have something going on. We have to have a draw. We have to have an event. We don't have um, the food as a constant, consistent draw. And so um, drumming up business by, by engaging people to come in the door and uh, come out for an event, it, it costs more and we realize that. So we've doubled our budget here based on that. That makes sense. Well, we need to find a, a stopping point. Uh, I want to say I appreciate everyone attending. Uh, we'll we'll uh, end with where we started. Uh, Dr. Martinez, if you'd like to come forward, uh, we'll ask her as deputy director from the, the city. Uh, this was uh, her team that helped pull this together. So uh, we'll let you uh, wrap us up here, if you would. Well, before uh, we go, please help me thank all of our speakers for wonderful ideas, wonderful content. <laughs> we are really grateful to have this amazing business community. Please take advantage to connect with them, to keep uh, picking their brains and intermingle between you because you have a lot of information among yourselves that, that can help your business. So please make sure that you meet somebody that you haven't, hadn't met before this session. Um, Cruz is uh, helping us distribute the grateful, um, a little bit of a token from the city of Las Cruces in uh, appreciation of your time and information. Who learned something today? Please raise your hand if you learned something today. Awesome. That's, that's our goal. And we'll keep uh, bringing this type of uh, events to you. As I heard, it's our job to bring content 
and to bring it uh, in frequency as well. So we also got a lot of, of uh, information that we are going to continue to implement. Um, as we continue to provide, connect the dots on things that are happening in our community, I'd like to speak to you about other events related to businesses. Um, and also, if you have a business idea and you're, you're not an entrepreneur uh, full bloom yet, you can also um, join some of these events for now. Kerry, do you want to speak to the Green Chamber uh, events happening? All right, just to be on record with the microphone, March 20th um, workshop with Google, March 21st uh, green drinks with a green chamber, uh, next first Fridays, April 5th, uh, and this is how to talk about your business in a public setting, all, uh, all these items from the green chamber. We also have in other events from other partners in, in our community is the Women Entrepreneur Coffee Meetup. This is March 22nd, 8 to 9, and this is as at Mom's Coffee. Uh, also uh, sponsored by Arrowhead Center and West Corporation here, uh, Women Business, Women Entrepreneur in Business. This is April 3rd. They have a workshop in the afternoon of April uh, 3rd, 1 to 5 p.m., and then followed up with a conference on April 4th, 9 to 4 p.m. at the Convention Center. Uh, another good uh, possible idea, maybe for you, your staff, your neighbors, Community Action Agency has right now free tax returns for a majority of people who are patient enough to wait there. Also, SBDC, the Small Business Development Center, they have a few events coming up. How to start your own business, March 21st, 3.30 to 4.30. This is uh, the ACC Workforce Center. Also, reach out citizens, uh, customers online with Google. This is April 30th, uh, 3 to 4, also at the ACC. And finally, West is putting up uh, Etsy Craft Entrepreneurs. This is March 28th, 10 to 3 p.m. So a lot of things happening. Please take advantage of things that, uh, that different partners put together for your benefit. And that's all I have for now. Thanks, everybody, for being here. And thanks to Tom for hosting us. Delicious food here.